I feel like a fish out of water here. Uh, I have never been an auditor. I've never been a financial accountant. I did work for Deloitte though on a consulting side. We went up the elevator, the consultants went one direction, the auditors went the other direction. I now work in academia where there's a metaphorical elevator where the financial accounting researchers go that way and the token managerial accountants go this way. Okay, that, that's where I'm coming from here. I'm gonna take what we talked about a lot today and not just the performance measurement and governance and some other things, and let's take a step back. I come from a school where we have one section of audit. We've got a huge undergrad program, 850 MBAs a year, one section of audit, nobody takes audit. We don't, they, the big accounting companies don't do it. So we as an accounting department, being their chair, we have these discussions, what is accounting? And to be perfectly honest, what I think accounting is, is measurement. Attestation comes after that, Right, but I think what we are, we're the measurement people, and I think we're losing some of that. So what, what I'm gonna talk about a bit is, we're gonna talk about risk management boards and disclosures and governance. Let's take a step back, right? How well do the companies measure themselves? Because we're talking a lot about this external reporting. We all kind of know how it runs. It's just a matter of what we present. I'm not so sure about that, whether the companies themselves we're actually doing that great of a job here. So this is very similar to what was just put up there on the Deloitte framework. If you kind of think about broadly, you know, the term people use now is not performance measurement, it's performance management. Right? We kind of have two sets of players here. But yes, we ideally, even when we're doing audit, we should be starting out with strategy. How is it that we think we're gonna create value? I mean, I, I don't even know how you would audit this stuff till we think about that. But then the big thing is this notion of a business model and here's what I always do when I go into with companies when we start talking about performance measurement. First, I make them present the business strategy. <coughs> and I say, give me the business model. And, and a lot of people call these strategy maps. What are the steps that we have to take to make that business model work? But send the executives in different rooms to draw this thing out. And it is amazing how little consensus you will get in the same firm after we presented the strategic plan and we all agreed on it. Well, if we can't figure out how do we think as an organization we're actually gonna create value more specifically. How can I figure out what key performance measures are? Right, because a lot of key performance measures are is, am I making the right progress? Am I implementing it the way I want? And finally, has it worked? But if we can't get this consensus up front, which in many cases, I'm not sure we have, and I do think it's an area that we as accountants can help out a lot, right? Then we can kick, pick out the KPIs. We can worry about disclosing it afterwards. Let's make sure we have the right ones. And then where this risk management thing comes in here is, you know, what can go wrong here? And let me, let me be perfectly honest, one thing that go wrong, you pick the wrong performance measures. People will track, I mean, they'll chase whatever you pay them for, right? And all of us have probably been to companies that have dashboards and scorecards, and you ask them, have you ever really seen if that measure goes up and down, if it predicts anything of economic consequence that you care about? No, it must be true, it's gotta be true. So right before the financial crisis, Dave Larker and I, we've done a lot of work on performance measurement, we were talking to the board of directors of a big financial institution right before the financial crisis. So we were talking about this as performance indicators and one of the directors goes, we get 400 performance indicators for every board meeting. He says, I can't run a company. Can you tell me the 10 I should watch for? The other ones can be underneath that, right? So really I think what we need to do before we start talking about what do we disclose and what do we want to focus on is can we get down to what are the key indicators? I do think they're, business, they're company specific. Right? I'm not sure we we're talking about you know, sales, but if we're talking about a broader disclosure model, everything doesn't have to be lockstep. Right? If we can show that this measure predicts cash flows in the future, I think an analyst would care. Our function would be, are you consistent in how you measure that? You're not lying to me, right? We've got some evidence that when your satisfaction metric goes up, it predicts future cash flows. Okay, we as the auditor, let me attest that you're measuring it the same way, because you could always change the questions. Right? So there's kind of a generic framework that covers a lot of what we've talked about today. Now obviously there's lots of risk in the business model. We as accounts have traditionally focused on you know, internal control risk, financial market risk, crap, you know, but there's lots of things. You know, talk about cybersecurity. You talk to board members, this is the big one in their mind. And at least the board members I talk to, they say we're never gonna stop it. We're never gonna stop this. Right? Part of what they wanna do is have a, a a plan in place, as soon as it happens, let's minimize the downside. And part of that's public relations, right? So there's a whole bunch of those. Now if you think about it, if the business model says, this is how I'm gonna create value for the firm, it also kinda helps you figure out where, where, where might the risk be, 
right? If I think I'm going to do this, but again, you got to lay, it's not just a strategic plan. It's how am I going to do this? And I think one area where we, as the measurement people, and I'm going to call us the measurement people because that, that's what I think we are, can help out here. One is articulating these business models because I think disclosure is an after the fact part of this. But the other part is, can we get into this whole notion of stress testing? Right? We, uh, this morning, people were talking about earnings forecasts. Right? Earnings forecast is an outcome of some model that even if I haven't laid it out, it's in my head. Here's how I think we're going to create value. Here's how it's, you know. So if then if you could figure out where the risks are, I think we as accountants, if we want these, don't give me a point estimate, give me a range, could say, here's the pressure points we should test on that. Right? Then we could start figuring out the risk management. You know, I, I don't want every risk. You read some of these disclosures in the US that I'll talk about in a minute. Right? They're pages long, but everybody's talking about exactly the same thing, because I want to protect myself. Now, what I think I both as a management team and as an investor want to know, what are the critical ones in this business given your business model? And I think that's where we have a great opportunity there. Now, I was kind of surprised this morning somebody said, no, this is not just a matter of the auditors bringing in somebody from the consulting side. Actually, perfectly honest, I think that's what we should be doing, right? I mean, this is really, we're trying to, I, I think what we're trying to do is tell us the financial model that creates these outcomes that we're going to test to, right? And part of that is understanding the operations here, right? Now, one of the big buzzwords we hear is this whole notion of enterprise risk management that was brought up earlier. So, yes, CPA Canada, we, we as accountants are actually taking the lead here. Some of you are familiar with COSO, right? They started with the internal control framework. That became ERM. In fact, we kind of started this. It's kind of getting out of our hands, and I think others are taking it over. Right? This is CPA Canada's, which is basically some of the same notions that you have in the COSO framework. So let's identify these particular adverse events or circumstances relevant to the objectives, assess the likelihood and magnitude, determine a response or mitigation strategy, monitor progress. Right? And that's going to be the key one because we have to come up with some kind of even if it's a qualitative assessment, how are we doing on this? Now, I think one thing we've got to be careful with. I've been listening today. Everybody keeps talking about downside risk. That's because we as accountants think about internal control, right? In the ERM framework, it's not just downside risk. It's downside and upside. We've all taken finance classes, right? There's a risk return trade-off. None of this says get rid of risk. It says understand your risks. Understand which ones you as a company are talking about risk tolerances and risk appetites, what we're willing to take on. If I actually understand them better, I may take on more risk of area I think I'm really good at. Get rid of the unwanted risks. Right? There's nothing in these frameworks that says get rid of risk, but I think that's part of our internal control mindset is we only think of the downside, but there is also an upside. It's kind of get rid of the downside, get the bad risks, and get rid of risk. We're just not very good at this. Right. So just one big question always before we start talking about disclosure a little bit, does this stuff seem to be informative at all to, to the market? This is just, I'm doing some work with Aon, the big insurance brokerage firm. And what we've come up with is this little online benchmarking survey that companies could take. So it's not for academic research. Some of you who work for companies, you can actually take this thing. It's a pretty long and extensive survey. But part of what we're looking at is they put these on this risk maturity score that basically takes the COSO framework, answer these questions, we're going to come up with a score that ranges from one is low to five is high. And if you do look at it, it does look like the companies with higher risk management have lower stock price volatility. Right? It does look like they have higher return on equity. Now you may be saying, how could that be true? I took finance. You can't have higher returns with, with less risk. Well, if you're getting rid of unwanted risk, Right? It could be the case that that's happening, right? You can take on the risks that you want, but get rid of the kind of the downside stuff on this. This is correlation, not causation, but it does look like it, it is somewhat informative. So maybe, maybe we disclose it, right? If that's the point of disclosure is leading information about future cash flows, okay? The other thing is we've done some research, we're talking about some research we're doing. One big issue always is management earnings forecasts. So it turns out companies that do and this is actually Deloitte's term, risk-based planning and forecasting. Basically put risk more into your planning and earnings forecasting, especially things like distributions and stochastic models. Have more different functions, put inputs into this as opposed to just the finance guys. And it turns out companies that do a better job of incorporating these in these risk models 
have much better management earnings forecasts, controlling for lots of other stuff. Right? So again, these are the things that we do, right? I mean, we're worried about management earnings forecast, but you gotta develop this model up front there. So it does look like it could be value relevant, right? Before we even worry about disclosure, it does look like it might be. Now, one of the issues is, what's the board's role? Well, we're talking about governance this morning. One of the big issues there is, the board is supposed to play a big role in this, right? We're gonna determine this risk tolerance as we were talking about in consultation, we're gonna evaluate the company's strategy and business model in the context of this risk tolerance, right? We're gonna come up with these risk indicators or KRIs, right? And then figure out whether we have, at least from a traditional accounting standpoint, the right internal controls on this. Well, here's the board risk oversight framework that CPA Canada has come up with. Okay, so we'll use this as kind of the benchmark. If we're gonna talk about disclosure of this stuff, right? Kind of the same thing, establish context, identify risk, analyze quant consequences. Notice the word quantify. Again, we're talking a lot about qualitative stuff. I, I think one of our expertise is quantification, right? What faculty don't like? Questions with no numbers, okay? That's what we do. We're kind of the quantification people. One of the big ones here and something where we're gonna have to do a lot more, what's the interconnectedness across risks? Right? This is like squeezing a balloon, right? I get rid of this risk and it pops up somewhere else. Or I think I'm fixing a financial control risk and it causes a risk somewhere else. Right? Reanalyze consequences, prioritize, assess. Right? So we as accountants have already come up with frameworks. Right? It's a matter of if this is the framework and we think this is, gonna, is important and it does look like this stuff is a leading indicator of some kind of cash flows, should we think about disclosing this? Now there's lots of risk disclosures we could have. So it turns out in the United States, there's a couple of risk disclosures you're required to have. One is a section that basically describes what types of risks do we face, right? We'll go through what people actually talk about there. There's another disclosure, disclosure requirement that is specifically about board risk oversight you're required in the United States to say, here is the role of the board in risk oversight. And in addition to that, in the same section, have we thought about risk when we came up with our compensation plan for our executives? Right? So th th there are some requirements there, how effective we'll talk about it, but here's some things we could talk about. Right? There are these risk factors, let's just tell you what the risks are, how prevalent they are. One thing we'll, that we'll talk about, are these companies specific or not? Right? Everybody's gonna say one risk is the economy. Of course it is, right? I mean, you wouldn't be in business. What are the trends? But we're gonna spend some time talking about not just what the risks are, what efforts are we putting into it to actually manage this? I mean, it doesn't really help me so much as an investor just to know there are risks, right? I wanna know how you're gonna to respond to this stuff if they materialize. There's gotta be risks, otherwise we're not gonna make a return. Then board oversight and this whole notion of risk-taking incentives. So if you're in the United States, you may be required to talk at least some about this. Now, how much you actually talk about it is not so clear. Well, it turns out, that if somebody wants to look at, there was the IRRC Institute, they just came out with a review of US financial statements, saying what do people talk about in these financial statements about the risks, not the risk management, not the board oversight. And their review, it's actually interesting, on page after page of by industry, here's what people talk about, here's the risks. But their general conclusions are very similar to what we heard this morning, right? Streamline the language around common risk factors. You know, paragraphs of describing the same thing that everybody else is describing as well that don't tell you anything, okay? You don't really need that. You know, I guess I can't use boilerplate, Miguel. You got, what, what was the other word? Generic, generic, generic disclosures there, right? <laughs> a, a, a lot, yeah, well, a lot of what they also, and I'm sure you found the same thing looking at this stuff in the UK stuff, there's really not, a, not, a, it's not even that company specific. It's just kind of generic, here's kind of the risk we have, nothing specifically about what we do, do that causes that risk in there, right? They really don't say a heck of a lot about risk mitigation other than we do it, which doesn't really help anybody on that, right? And so what they were really pushing for is, if you're gonna do this, and this gets back to everything's company specific, give a lot more company specific detail about this. Not just the risk, Why, what is it about your company that causes this risk? What specifically are you gonna do? 
Can you describe the nature, intensity, and likelihood of this stuff, how it's changed? And people have talked about it's change is what we care about a lot here when we're talking about the financial stuff and how it might explain how it might affect your business. Well, that's just kind of what the risks are, right? There's also this board oversight disclosure. And it turns out, thank you, Deloitte, I stole this from you guys. There's the, there's the citation down at the bottom. Every year since 2010, there, there is an updated one, I just don't have it here. They go through the US board disclosures on board oversight and say, what are these people talking about? Right? And so you can look at the trends. It, it is going up a bit, but if you look at really what they're talking about, you know, okay, they tell me the full board is responsible for risk. Okay, I'm not sure how much importance that is gonna be on there. Right? Are other board committees noted as being involved in risk oversight? Well, that's probably useful. You know, do you have a risk committee? Is the comp committee? So that's probably a useful thing. Most people do that. Right? Right? Very little, like once you start getting below there, <coughs> It doesn't say anything about what the CEO does. It right? doesn't say really much of anything about the risk management practices inside the firm. Well, let's think about risk here. Okay, boards do not do risk management. Boards do risk oversight. Right? So here I am, I'm gonna tell you the oversight. I'm not gonna tell you any of the risk management stuff that actually goes on here. To be truthful, if I had to pick which one is probably more important in terms of risk, I wanna know which risk management practice what you're doing not just what does the board do in its meetings, right? But because the disclosure requirement is really about the oversight, this is basically what you're doing. Who's responsible for it on the board? Do we talk about it in board meetings? Some of the disclosures are about that long. Some of them are like 15 pages. And to be perfectly honest, after having read those, that one's about as informative as 15 pages on some of this stuff. You'll see a lot more in financial services because they have to. Right? But most of it really is not saying much about how do we actually do this, right? Does your risk oversight or management, is it lined with company strategy? Well, fewer than half the companies even talk about it. Forget about how good this stuff is. So there's a lot of opportunities here if, again, we believe we're in the measurement business, right? And I want to see how you manage this, you know. The other thing is, and there's nothing wrong with qualitative disclosures. Right? But the big push in risk management is we got to move between just qualitative, like it's low, medium, high. Let's try to quantify stuff. So all the ERM frameworks say let's combine more qualitative and quantitative stuff together. Turns out most of these are qualitative in nature. Right? This gets away from this whole notion of I'm going to come up with non-financial performance measures or business models. They're just not quantifying these things. Now, it, here's some explanations. We'll go through these. Maybe we just haven't done it ourselves. Pretty hard to actually put them in there when we haven't even thought about it, right? To kind of do this, you're talking about targets. Well, a target relies on me having a risk appetite and a risk tolerance. I don't know how to set a target otherwise for a KRI, KRI so maybe I haven't done that. These are board stuff. Maybe the board doesn't even know what's going on here. I and mean, we were talking about some of that this morning that, that they don't know, so how am I gonna do oversight on stuff that I don't know? So let's, I'll give you a little bit of data on this stuff. So again, this is this Aon survey. It is not an academic survey, it's a benchmarking survey. So I don't think it's a real bias, I want to say how great we're doing. And after looking at these responses, if they're saying how great we're doing, I feel pretty bad, right? So this is in general on performance, uh, risk management inside the companies, right? Have you identified risk metrics and indicators? Only 38% say they consistently do it for key risks. Right, we'll kind of do it for some of these. You were talking about projects. Maybe we do it for projects, but we don't do it across the board on that. A lot of things they do track, though, are really activities, not outcomes. Have we put the systems in place? Right? Have we implemented these things? Less of kind of the risk expo exposures. And in terms of have you set targets for these things, right, that's pretty abysmal. 29.4%, right? well, if you don't have these thresholds or tolerances, how do you know what you're doing? Well, obviously, it's got to be low because I don't even have quantitative numbers on it, right? But these are pretty low. So talking about disclosures when the companies aren't even doing in turn, they'll disclose anything you want them to disclose, right? So if you tell me to disclose risk management, I'll do it. But I'm not sure how informative it's going to be if they're not doing this stuff internally, right? Here's some other ones. Have you established a statement of risk appetite for the organization? 19.2%. Right? So you're talking about the guys below the board? It's, it's pretty low here. You know, do you, have you established 
statements of, of risk tolerance for key risk, 19.2. Do you have a quantified risk appetite or statements of risk tolerance? 19.5, right? Do you even know what your risk drivers are? You know, only about half of them. So again, before we start pushing down this path of let's start disclosing everything, right? Maybe we gotta figure out, does, does the company actually know what's going on here? They'll, they'll disclose things. I don't know how I can attest for anything till I can figure out what's going on inside the firm on this, right? So that's general risk management. The other big problem we have in companies, this was another study we did with IBM. Yeah. If you've got risk monitoring, a lot of times it's done completely separate from your performance measurement system. That kind of, it kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? I mean, it's kind of risk and return as you go through there. It's usually standalone on this. In terms of boards, right? Yes, a lot of them will define it. So it's kind of, it's similar to yours on, on terms of percentages, right? Boards, yeah, they say they understand the top risks, right? They kind of understand their existing risk activities. But here's some, you know, understanding of the quantified risk appetite, less than half of them. Right? How consistent is your understanding of your emerging risk profile? 61%. I mean, again, these are fairly low in terms of board oversight. And this is even separate from the performance measurement. So just point out a couple more. What do you report on? Most of the reporting is on activities as opposed to actual trends or outcomes on, on limits. So that's very non-quantitative on some of this stuff. So th there is not nearly as much of this going on inside of the firm as you would expect Right, all of us, you take your finance classes and you risk adjust your cost of capital. Turns out very few companies do that. Right, I mean, that's the simplest thing you would think about. In this survey, they don't do that. Right, right? having to necessarily establish objectives for this stuff. We don't, you know, risk management strategy, have you aligned it? You know, very few people formally even align this stuff. And here's a big one. They just don't talk to people outside these board meetings. Right, so if I'm trying to assess the risks here, and I'm a board member, you know, you go, you go in the board meeting, they talk about it, and that's about the extent of this stuff. So let me just finish. We've done some research trying to link up these things with kind of financial performance. And again, we've got board oversight, we've got board, we've got performance risk management, and we got outcomes. Now, again, if you think about it, there, there's actually incredibly low correlation between what companies say they're doing inside their firm and what they disclose. Actually, it's interesting when you put them in a two by two matrix, there's some people that talk about all kinds of stuff and then they say we're doing a terrible job, right? There's other people that say nothing and they say they're doing a great job. I mean, so there doesn't appear to be much correlation between the two. So I'm not sure I as an investor would know what to say. I think the correlation is about 15 to 20% on this stuff. It's, it's significant, but not very significant. So if you think about it conceptually, kind of boards are kind of establishing, we want you to put a, a risk management system in place and surveys have found that, right? That's gonna to lead to some involvement, some risk management processes and then risk taking. If we think about this as kind of a conceptual model that comes out a lot of COSO, here's some of the things we probably wanna disclose, right? Who is it that's responsible for risk management in your company? Right? A lot of times it's the audit committee, but there's this big pushback on, if you're an audit committee member, you're pretty busy already. Right? You probably know a lot about financial risk. It's not so clear that you know a lot about other stuff. It turns out, if at least in their board, in the charters, the board as a whole is responsible for risk management as opposed to one committee, right? those, those people have more board oversight and more risk management. It should be a whole board thing if you're gonna talk about risk strategically Right? Some things you could, you could talk about, some of this could be qualitative, some of this could be quantitative. You know, how well do we understand risk appetites, tolerances, what kind of reports do we get, what kind of alignment do we have on this stuff. Risk management processes, right? So we, here's, I think, what's missing a lot because that's really what I want to know about. And ultimately, all of that, if I want to form impressions as an investor, I need to know all of this stuff as opposed to this piecemeal thing we're doing now, but I'm not sure companies are doing this stuff very well, and I think we as accountants, it's a huge opportunity as the measurement people, right, to kind of get it straightened out inside the firm, and then we could attest to it, because I don't know if I would want to attest without really knowing what's going on inside in terms of these risk management practices. Okay.